Most weekends were focused on extraordinary examples of someone's faith. For example, St. Paul being knocked off his horse and blinded. Or the ten lepers cured that we heard about two weeks ago. Not the case this weekend. Maybe you know someone like this. He was ordinary. He did not attract attention. He took pains to avoid it, so it seems. In one sense, I never knew him. Such was his silence. His gentle eyes pointed down. He carried out his tasks without fuss or complaining. As time went by, I would say hello, and I would meet him, and he would smile with a wide grin and greet me with real gladness. We'd exchange some small talk and then go back to the rest of our day. I would see him sitting in silence in church before many people arrived and remaining there until almost everybody left. I speak of this good man not to publicize him or honor him, something that would be a shock to him, but because my heart is more at ease for my encounters with him. God made himself known to me through him. In a word, he was a humble man. He served gladly, but the world would not call him a success. No Instagram likes for him. Our first reading from Sirach reminds me of him. The one who serves God willingly is heard. His petition reaches the heavens. The prayer of the lowly pierces the cloud. It does not rest till it reaches its goal. Nor will it withdraw till the Most High responds. Justice judges justly and affirms the right. And the Lord will not delay. Prayer that pierces the clouds and does not rape until it reaches its goal. My friend's prayer, whatever they may be, surely reached God. The prayer that finds, that finds heaven is that of the lowly. Such prayer stands before God's throne not because it's wild and stormy, but because it embodies the hushed spirit of of truth. It whispers humble needs to the very one who can answer them. It doesn't have a single a, a, a hidden purpose. And so now we turn to the gospel. Which of the following people do you think embodies humility and simplicity? First the Pharisee. Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I pay tithes on my whole income. Now the tax collector, or just as likely my quiet, unassuming friend. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, the Pharisees are not the most comfortable topic for reflection. Maybe because we know that they remind us so often of ourselves. What was wrong with them? Nothing. They tried to be good, and after all, that's what we want, right? To be good, to be saved from being less than the perfect, exquisitely lovely person that we all want to be. And of course, that's what God wants us to be. But there is something else. The Pharisee wants to be known for being good, wants to be applauded and acknowledged and supported in his goodness. Well, we are obliged to give good example, aren't we not? We want to be applauded and acknowledged, right? But Jesus reminds us today that there is a different 
a better way. There is a different kind of spiritual success. One does not, not play for front seats and special treatment in Instagram likes, but can rest in the satisfaction of a job well done. Are we ashamed to acknowledge that this is really what we too want? The security of feeling that we have done our job well and that the results are reliable? To have competed well and finished the race, as St. Paul reminds us in his letter to Timothy today. Jesus cautioned against contempt, against thinking ourselves better than others. And I think that's the reason he used the Pharisees so often, as a punching bag. He had many things in mind, mind you, when he said that. But I suspect he was also cautioning us about how we feel about ourselves and treat others, if we're honest. Against common wisdom, religious life cycle, religious lifestyle, as important as it is, does not and cannot, repeat, cannot measure a relationship with God. We cannot make progress to someone who, by definition, is infinite. Only a heart that is open to God can draw close to him. Because the open heart lets God come close. We can't grow close to God by ourselves. But God can come close to us. Because he is God. And I find this the hardest part of my own spiritual life. It's not about myself drawing closer to God but allowing God to draw himself closer to me. He acts, and I hopefully receive and respond. And maybe, maybe to stop putting roadblocks between us. Who's in charge of the heart? The question cuts to the heart of spirituality. That which stands at the very core of the person becomes the battleground. Are we in charge? Or God? If we believe God is in charge, how do we know God is close? We cannot know or brag through our own efforts. We can only know when we allow God in when we open our hearts to God and his love. And opening the heart is a lifelong process. We progress one moment and one issue at a time. And then we fall backwards. Whatever internal battles my quiet, unassuming friend face, I thank God that I was blessed to receive his gracious, shy, unassuming love. He reminds me that life is a mixture of simple things, labor and pain, blessings and joy. He figured out how to open himself up to God. The world doesn't notice him. But God does. And so for one day, let us pause and give thanks to God who makes himself known not only in the extraordinary thunderbolt events of each of our lives, but in the simple moments and people that we experience every day. Be they consoling moments or difficult ones. We would do well to try and be like my friend this day.